everyone welcome uh, to this session. So uh, today I will just basically uh, give you a bit brief introduction about what I've been doing um, in Australia and also um, one case study for dermatology, skin AI, and uh, one case study for ophthalmology um, for eye disease. Uh, so normally I start with the, this picture is the called the trump of death. Uh, so it's actually showing and that's, um, we'll say, in, on the dark era where we don't have any knowledge uh, from the modern uh, medicine. And that's uh, the pandemic happening 600 years ago. It's Black Death or Spanish flu uh, basically killed and affected tens of millions of uh, Europeans. Um, and then this disease obviously is, has no discrimination, kills no, no matter you are male, female, kids, elderly, or uh, from whatever uh, cultural background or uh, social background. Then uh, for the tradition, I would say for the uh, first time in the resonance, which is 100 years later after the Black Death, uh, people start to understand what is medicine uh, by starting uh, at anatomy, basically by understanding the structure of the human body. So that actually set up a very important foundation of the modern medicine. And when you ask me the question, what's the key difference between traditional medicine and the modern medicine? There are so many ways to define it, right? It can be um, the way understanding about spread of the disease, even like the pandemic um, 600 years ago, the doctors used to believe the scent of the flowers uh, put in the mask can stop spread um, of the virus. Uh, while the modern medicine, we understand how it spreads through the airborne, right? Then we can wear masks and also the cover to protect spreading of the disease. And other example is from the therapy side, traditionally we have a, a traditional medicine uh, portion. Now we have uh, the gene therapy, uh, like uh, CAR T, uh, cost you 1.2 million IMP per shot. Right? It's basically engineer your T cell and your B cell, they inject back to your bloodstream, then it can find and locate and and cancer cells better. Normally it's being widely used to treat a leukemia. Um, then in my group, I think the main thing is affecting my group research is called um, healthcare data digitalization. Pretty much uh, all the data we see these days with the modern technology like MI, CT scans, uh, we can pretty much invasively or non-invasively observe so many modalities like a retina image, and college thermoscope images, uh, your vessel condition, your, your brain condition, for example, right? Uh, so even these days, the genome uh, sequencing, uh, even for full genome sequencing, 3.2 billion pairs, the cost uh, can be as low as less than 500 USD, which is 100 times, uh, 100 folds cheaper than compared to 20 years ago. And uh, no matter talking about other like EHR, EMR, and EEG, EFH data. Um, so there are three main summarization points I want to talk about on the era of information and digitalization. First is medical data digitalization. So like what I've said, uh, showed in the previous slides, uh, basically EHI, EMR, clinical report. Uh, I, don't, I know many of you do come to vision and the uh, neural language processing um, can basically process and parse those, those data perfectly. Uh, second is there now the whole medical field is moving into multi-source. A multi modality, multi cohorts, and multi subs. So, this is basically covered by lots of data linkage research. Right? We link up uh, the data and align them from different hospital and healthcare providers. And the last one is uh, continuous monitoring. Uh, is there many medical devices now? It's uh, 24 by 7, keep collecting your, um, your physiological data, like your post data, the temperature. And, and do some elemental analysis. And so Apple Watch is a perfect example. So Apple Watch, you can say it is a medical device. It has got an FEA category two uh, regulation a couple of months ago. Uh, I think AI will play a huge role. So one thing I haven't added in is I think uh, synthetic data or data generation will be another important trend. Uh, I think uh, a very good example is actually here, all the three pictures is actually generated by Dell E, the diffusion model um, through the website. I just type in his title. So actually uh, automatically generate, generate pretty uh, plausible, I will say useful <laughs> pictures for me. Uh, so the breakthrough in the medical AI field in the last few years is uh, I'll say a few of them. So one of the biggest obviously is uh, 
2017, that is called uh, medical democratization uh, by using mobile phone and AI algorithm uh, can use it for skin cancer uh, detection and early diagnosis. Uh, other work is uh, representative work is the deep, deep minds uh, the AI algorithm after fold is able to accurately and precisely uh, reconstruct and create the 3D um, protonome structures, uh, which means AI model can be relatively cheap to utilize. We don't need to spend tens of millions of dollars on the pro OEM. Those are super, super expensive microscopic um, um, devices. So uh, we start by looking at spectrum, uh, what kind of disease is affecting most of the population globally. So obviously high blood pressure, smoking, high blood sugar uh, is now the main killer for CBD. Uh, so it's a cardiovascular diseases. But many of them actually are chronic disease. They are not like acute disease, you can use diagnosis. So that's why we divide our research topic uh, into five uh, into four directions. So first is a more traditional diagnosis, but I put a, a keyword called real world because we need to solve problems like real time inference, uh, how to dealing with the noise label and the long tail distribution where you observe so many rare medical device, me medical diseases, uh, open source, uh, OD problem or uncertainty problem. How do you quantitatively uh, measuring uh, the certainty of the prediction? So for chronic diseases, pro, uh, procrastination is obviously very important. We want to know uh, so when the disease has happened and how the disease will progress in the next, let's say, two to four years. So that's why as a case study, melanoma lesion progression is a very important uh, uh, implementation. So we have uh, spent so much time in the last few years and the uh, cardiovascular uh, risk analysis because many of the diseases is like your life habits and many of the envir environmental factors accumulated over the last five, 10, even 20 years, then suddenly it break out. Uh, so post diagnosis and treatment is something we want to say to close the loop because I know the whole, I'm attending Mikai this week in Singapore, by the way, the whole Mikai community in the last 10 years focused a lot on the diagnosis part but however, the treatment and the post-diagnosis is not managed very well. I don't see many research topics. Uh, so that's why in one of the research problems, we are using AI algorithm to help uh, epilepsy, neurodegeneration disease patients, help them to select the right or optimize medicine drug selection at the first visit uh, in, the, in the clinic. Um, other problem we're trying to solve is called clinical support because many AI algorithms facing the difficulties they can't be integrated into the clinical workflow that easily. Of course, the difficulties come from two sides. One is the patient side, another is the clinicians, the user side. Yes, so to summarize on the technical uh, map, so we start at the bottom as the ML machine learning theory. We do lots of knowledge discovery and understanding, uh, NAS neural network architecture search or self-device learning, uh, open set OD problem uh, in the uh, middle level we do and high level uh, interpretation, uh, make a more trustworthiness AI, uh, domain uh, adaptation, and to adapt to different scenarios, clinical settings, vision language, multimodality learning. Uh, on the medical uh, application side, we cover skin, brain, eye, uh, invasive, non invasive sensors uh, of the human body. So, the first study uh, I want to share, share with every one of you is our work on the, the real world diagnosis and to achieve this goal. Uh, so from the data informatics side, what do we want is we want to collect family history, link up all the clinical variables together, like age, gender, family history, uh, certain exposure, uh, outdoor activities, something like that, you know, normally in a survey data. And genome sequencing, uh, we're trying to figure out, uh, we already know there are some uh, single variant points might increase the risk of getting skin cancer, but we also want to discover the undiscovered and or unexplored uh, the locus of your gene or gene regulation to understand better about uh, melanoma. Uh, on the imaging side, uh, which is computer vision technology, we apply that as a uh, general um, mobile phone or thermoscope pictures. And also we spend uh, $10 million on the 3D vector machine. Uh, the machine is uh, it's basically it's multi, multi task, multi team work. We, we assume a team, if there's a team of uh, more than, I think, 10 departments. So this is a, a 3D vector machine. So 
Uh, what's special about it is that uh, it can cover your whole body at high resolution and doing the 3D reconstruction in less than 30 seconds of time. And the advantage is it's able to detect, capture, and monitor and register every single lesion across the body. So a typical and a pale skin person and normally has more than 300 to 500 of the moles and lesions. It's nearly infeasible and impossible you ask a, a dermatologist or GP to go, go, go through all of them uh, one by one. So the 3D vector machine capturing all the information plus the AI to detect a crop and the monitoring, uh, we believe is a, a very, very feasible solution. So on the computer vision side, so actually we did lots of work by combined with the, uh, the image from the 3D vector machine. So we start with a very, very simple deep learning network back in 2017. And a very, very early study we published and uh, show the AI model can do as good as work as the dermatologist, which is a specialist, um, but much better than general practice, which is a primary care uh, level. Um, so the sequential images is uh, very interesting because we have collected, uh, we ask patients to come back every six or every 12 months so we know how their lesion grow or how their lesion change. So if it's melanoma, you will possibly observe the lesion like this, right? So it keep growing. And so the color keep getting more dark intensity. So actually what's happening underneath the, uh, the skin is there you have uh, your tumor and your cancer cells grow into your vessel. So that uh, represents stage three, stage four, uh, which is very, very uh, dangerous uh, stage. It's basically pro progressively involving uh, melanoma. But how are we going to do it? Is there if we, what, what about we build a, a temporal and a spatial network when you're capturing the difference or the growth of the lesion? Of course, we have pre-processing part embedded in the network, try to align uh, and register, uh, register the skin lesion together, then we are able to uh, more accurately capture the change of the boundary and also the color. Uh, we also have an extra model is to doing um, the temporal distillation, try to distill the late stage knowledge back into the early stage, because we, what we want to do is early skin cancer detection. So another topic, uh, pretty interesting, is uh, it's called ugly duckling. So basically, we're not comparing person to person, but comparing lesion to lesion. So we collect hundreds of lesions from uh, one person now, and then we use uh, AI algorithm to find out the top five, the, the deadly the most or the high risk skin melanoma could be high skin melanoma compared to the rest of the, of the lesion. So from the algorithm part is basically uh, two challenges. So a traditional loop is that we put a lesion picture into a CNA model, can be on any traditional machine learning model that we tell it's malignant, it's cancer, or it's benign, um, it's not cancer. And then in the ugly duckling problem, we interfeeding multiple lesions from one personnel, can be a few hundred into model. Then we want to select the top five, right? Of course, from the modeling structure, we have a perfect solution, uh, which is a transformer. Basically, we totalize every single skin lesion pictures uh, into a CNN embedding. Obviously, we want to fit in all the raw pixels however, you know, due to the memory constraint. Uh, it's not possible. Uh, we have a pre-CNN uh, pre-trained uh, embed all the pictures and all the uh, CNN embeddings goes into the transformer, tokenize and put in the self-supervised learning, uh, general NLP multilayer perception, uh, getting the probability and also aggregation uh, layers to group and subgroup uh, a few of the high-risk skin uh, lesions together then put it on group contrastive learning, then we, what we get is a top five or top 10, top 10 and use, uh, I will be present this to the clinicians. They're gonna tell uh, if uh, there's any melanoma or cancer at all. Yeah, uh, so there's actually a uh, open data set, uh, public available data set, which is pretty large, 30,000. So this year, uh, I see data set, we are expanding to double the number. Uh, which can cover more cases. So if you're interested, obviously, uh, please feel free to use this data set to verify your idea. Uh, yeah, so here's some visualization. I know it's a bit small, uh, but uh, what I want to say is that there are some uh, melanoma, malignant lesions like this one, 
uh, and malignant lesions like that one is obviously receive much higher score uh, from the model. Uh, another work we, we did is a hierarchy of learning. So this is trying to solve the problem. Uh, we want to put a hierarchical label. It's a like image map. You have word map, uh, right? And that obviously a lot of people are just using the last bottom layer, but we want to provide more richer information uh, to the physicians. So we're trying to build a hierarchical machine learning model and system. I think for the hierarchical part, we have collected 200,000 images covering 65 classes. So we have, a, this is a, the map to show in the hierarchy plot. So the level one, topless level is obviously only benign and malignant. Uh, so the clinicians can, can take the message basically like, um, on the level of demands they want. Sometimes they just don't want to go to that much details. Yeah. From the modeling side, uh, basically we have hierarchical class distance encoding, uh, prototype learning, uh, CN transformer structure, I guess. Many terms are very familiar to all of you. Uh, so basically we want different level and hierarchical of classes features be encoded by different layer of the network. Uh, so we group them together by assigning them to different losses, putting a scaling factors. Then we are able to balance the weights and the gradients that propagated for each, every single layer. Yeah, so the last part of publishing BMJ, which is top uh, prestigious journal, uh, uh, we apply uh, our AI algorithm, which is shown to you uh, to a clinical trial stage. Uh, so that's a phase one where just a normal route. Yeah, so it actually has treatment, follow-up, feedback, a general route without any AI intervention. So here on the active phase, we put an AI assessment provided to the registrar or GP. Uh, we put two models, one is a present before they make a decision, one is after, and then they can tell, oh, so which one actually is getting better results. Right? So based on our, on our observation, so our AI model can together with the clinicians can uh, increase the sensitivity, which is the recall rate of uh, malignant lesions, but on the specificity rate actually has dropped a bit, which means it has some, uh, some overkill as well, more far parties. Um, but of course, that's a just primary result. In the future, we want to um, put in more algorithms because the 3D vector machine is still in early stage. We have only collected 400 patients. So in the next three years, we want to uh, collect another 10,000. So at that time, we will have more data. And uh, I, I believe at that time, the algorithm of AI will be um, more precise and accurate. Yeah, so second study is AI research in ophthalmology. So ophthalmology is for eye, eye disease. Um, but uh, you're probably asking, uh, since we're very interested in cardiovascular disease, your heart, uh, your brain, and your blood pressure, uh, what has anything to do uh, with retina? Actually, it does, uh, because that's a typical retina uh, picture. So normally, that's the only way we can learn invasively observe your vessel. This is the artery, right? So this is a vein, right? Uh, so this actually are very strong biomarkers uh, related to your cardiovascular uh, diseases. Right? So there are many medical papers has already show, demonstrate the results that by looking at maybe your molecular region, uh, which is um, purely age related and your vessel, it can give you some uh, uh, very relevant or corresponding uh, risk assessment on your heart, and then your heart disease and brain disease. And we know there are shortage of doctors, not only in China, uh, also globally. And I'm also only putting a number for ophthalmologists, which is an eye doctor, and uh, not even telling about uh, the cardiovascular conditions. Um, so our blueprint or big picture is that we start by using AI model on the more general eye diseases, like age-related macular degeneration disease, Glaucoma, and then generalized to heart uh, disease like CVD, hypertension, and uh, then starting doing clinical trial inside the hospital, then um, implement it and deploy massively out of the hospital uh, or in the primary care uh, organizations. So we have set up three stages. So uh, phase one, we we'll basically leverage uh, SOTA. Uh, AI research and informatics to establish a uh, research scheme first. Then second is we partner and provide 
high quality and regulated screen services in and out the hospital. Uh, last step is discover early and better manage chronic disease. So chronic disease is key because most of the disease you see here is a uh, chronic disease, doesn't happen overnight. So Google uh, Health AI or DeepMind has deployed the DR, so diabetic retinopathy, your blood spot point on the retina to Thailand uh, two years ago, uh, 2020, two years ago. Uh, and the result was not that ideal. The reason is they still have so many engineering problems uh, can not be covered offline. For example, overexposure uh, of the camera, uh, your camera uh, quality varies from image to image. Uh, and also uh, they don't, in Thailand, they don't have a completely dark room, which uh, leading to uh, the light overexposure uh, for all the pictures. Yeah, take that loose. Uh, so we have done some discovery. So we published paper in Nature Eye uh, mm -hmm. this year. First, try to discover if eye disease and eye picture, retina picture, can be relevant to the retinal vein occlusion. So it's a purely image classification and a segmentation task. And it works pretty well. I would say, okay, there's a evidence showing uh, there are some diseases we can cover, not only eye disease, but uh, to a much larger spectrum. So we published another paper, try to link the eye diseases to the hyperthyroidism, which is a, a control um, for your estrogen and a release of the body. Of course, that affects so many things. High estrogen could mean uh, a very high risk of cancer of certain type. Um, and the AUC is also pretty good. So at least that's another important milestone showing the retina uh, can be another very important uh, biomarker for systematic diseases across the body. Uh, on, the, on the different modality part, so we tried on the ultra wide field UWF image modality. And um, part of the TMI, uh, I think last year, uh, is to uh, train on the funnels camera, but apply to another modality. It shows relatively good generalization, even without the adaptation. Uh, so, human AI, as I have mentioned, interaction is also very important. So, we're publishing JAMA uh, network as a, to research uh, a better way and how the human can help the machine learning AI model to correct and calibrate its confounding factors. So confounding factor, it means if you work on MNIST uh, from one to nine, right? Uh, train or in a grayscale, but your, your zero class is with a colorful, colorful or red color. For the test, you put whatever in red color, even if it's one to nine, it's recognized as zero. So confounding factor is red in this case. So there's so many confounding factors in so many retinal cases and the medical image as well. So we design algorithm which can let human easily interact with the AI algorithm. Uh, and by touch uh, the relative region, then the model is able to update it by itself. Uh, yeah, and also on the generative model side, uh, we uh, create the algorithm and to show a patient if they don't use their eye carefully. So uh, after maybe two to four years time, uh, they're going to see lots of tiger uh, yeah, happening at the back of their retina. If you are diseased high degree myopia, that's actually what you, your eye looks like. It's going to affect your macular region and uh, your optical desk ratio as well, which is a very strong biomarker of glaucoma. And we have done a large scale study in China uh, last year and uh, published uh, in the Lancet Digital Health. Uh, so we basically test our 14 class eye disease algorithm in 35 real world settings across China, East China to the West of China and the North China. And model wise, we use a multi-task and also uh, train with a multi-ensemble model scheme covering the basic eye diseases uh, uh, like AMD, DR, cataract to some more um, rare eye diseases like retina detachment, uh, which happens um, quite, quite frequently for those high degree of myopia um, patients. So we show our results here. It's a very medical paper format of showing the results. Um, so we have done the internal validation set. It's basically come from the same distribution. So we have also done the validation on the external and the clinical test. Uh, so overall, the results is quite stable. So stability and the robustness is uh, something we're targeting for. And here we also show compared to results with uh, a very well-educated and uh, experienced um, ophthalmology. So they're also, I'll say the AI is doing okay. It's doing fine 
obviously, uh, a few gap is doing, but at the current stage, it's doing a satisfactory one. So uh, the first step we're trying to do is uh, we try to replicate a score. A score is called CVD, AUS CVD. It's basically it's an it's equation or formula. You put in your input is H, gender, the blood pressure, uh, systolic blood pressure. Uh, your blood cholesterol, uh, history of diabetes and smoking. It can give you a relatively a reasonable score on the next five to 10 years on your CVD uh, risk. So there are three classes. Uh, so score higher than 15% high risk and low, low risk is less than you know, maybe 10% of score. Um, yeah, so here are some uh, more accurate definition, high risk, moderate risk and low risk. Uh, so on the AI part, basically we're trying to put in a bundles image and going through the model. Uh, we're trying to regress, so it's a regression problem of classification for the, for the AUS CVD. Uh, so on the deployment side, because this grant requires a delivery on the final algorithm, so we have created a report doing segmentation, showing uh, so what clues we have used from the image, and uh, then we generate uh, a score. Right. But however, we also find some corner cases for some uh, CVD, high CVD risk patient. But on our AI model, the risk score is very low. And uh, the reason could be their eye vessel uh, is a very, has a huge, a high level of uh, elasticity, which that means it doesn't really affect uh, the vessel of the eye at all. That's because many chronic diseases, in order to show biomarkers uh, at the back of the retina, it takes time. So for a massive deployment side, so I've talked lots about the publication and AI part, but we also need to remember we, in order to put it in a medical setting, we need a hardware, we need a, a medical regulatory, a CE license or FDA, and we need a very good design uh, of, uh, of the report presented to the patient. That's why in the past few years, uh, my group has been collaborating, collaborating with Airdog, uh, in the model uh, of uh, research on both, I would say, end-to-end -end research of the of the Bundles camera and also the AI algorithm. Yeah, here's uh, some summary milestones of the company. So the company went IPO at around the same time as Sensor Time last year. Uh, so Airdog has worked out um, a pretty good solutions AI Bundles camera. So uh, this camera actually is a uh, mobile uh, and very cheap and lightweight. Uh, compared to a general um, uh, professional manufacturer like Topcon, each camera they sell for twenty to thirty thousand USD, while this AirDrop camera is uh, much much cheaper, maybe ten to twenty times cheaper. It's full automatic, uh, only needs an operator, doesn't need clinicians, uh, or even doesn't need nurse. Uh, it's, it's been approved uh, in China and NPA, and inside as a uh, edge computing devices to put in, uh, integrate our AI algorithm and do the diagnosis um, I've showed you before. Yeah, so, so currently um, the model plus AI algorithm is able to cover 55 kinds of health risk indicators, including cardiovascular systems, uh, nervous disease, and also metabolic system uh, as many as possible. It's been verified by already tens of millions of people. Um, and for the AI algorithm side, it has been trained by leveraging the pictures from, from the founder's camera. And if we found some quality we are not that satisfactory, then we can always go back and tune the, the hardware parameters. So that's the advantage when we have the hardware, software, and AI algorithm together. So in terms, yeah, so all the stuff I presented actually is based on and lots of publications, both in medical journal, uh, technical journal, um, and also we have published the blue paper, which is try to um, doing a large scanning of the young people um, uh, between um, 25 to 40 years old. Because most of the eye disease is people used to believe the high risk cohort is only for people over 55 years old, right? But these days, you know, every day I'm working, my computer uh, screen time is over 12 hours easily, right? It's actually affecting our eye health and conditions severely. So we did a, did a, a blue, blue paper, you can search online. Uh, we found out uh, in the range of 25 to 
uh, 40 range of young people in China, uh, more than 38% of them have eye, some eye condition problems, right? So which is a big issue that requires a huge attention. Otherwise, maybe 20, 30 years later, we will observe a huge population getting glaucoma and cataract. Yeah, uh, so just a quick advertisement. <laughs> Yeah, uh, for my group, Monash Medical AI. So currently we have a, a, a team of 30 people, but we're still actively recruiting for research fellows and PhD students and uh, various. Uh, we start our latest round in the late of this year. Uh, we'll keep continuing until the middle. Yeah, these are all my collaborators uh, working in different fields across the industry, uh, healthcare provider and uh, universities in order to make these things happen. Yeah, so obviously the pandemic affects us quite a lot, uh, not only in the research and also the traveling part. Uh, so this Mikai is actually my first international travel uh, since 2019. And, and uh, as a medical AI researchers, we do, do believe the good part uh, of the human beings, right? Other, and we believe uh, in the next three, five years, our society uh, we will gradually recover and hopefully we will see more visitors and more clothes collaboration and provide um, better solutions for the whole community. Yes, right. thank you very much for your attention.